All right, not only do we have AI that can generate entire worlds in 3D that you can edit, explore, and export into a variety of different applications, but we also have AI that can explore and take action within those worlds almost at human level performance. That is absolutely wild. So I'm talking about World Labs Marvel, which is now generally available, and Google DeepMind's latest Gentech research called SEMA2. Let's get into it. So World Labs Marble is now generally available. You can take as a starter an image and turn it into this 3D world that you can explore. You get this like Gaussian splatting representation as well as meshes and a bunch of other cool stuff. But that's not all. World Labs has given Marble an update, making it massively multimodal. Essentially what that means is beyond just giving it a text prompt or a single image, now you can provide multiple images, a video, and even a 3D scene that you then convert into, of course, Gaussian splats, the mesh that I mentioned, as well as images and videos that you can render out straight from their UI. So let's go through this one by one. Now, image or text to world is pretty straightforward. You drop in an image, you hit create, and you get this explorable 3D environment. It's pretty cool. The quality is quite phenomenal. Now, of course, the issue with this is there's only so much of the world that you can specify in a flat two-dimensional image with a limited field of view. So to solve this problem, Marble now supports multi-image prompting. So let's say you can provide a front and a back image and have that be cohesively put together in the 3D generation that you get. So let's say you want to have this diner and then you want to have this like apocalyptic sign over here. Both of those will be seamlessly weaved together in the generation that you get. Maybe you're building out a set and you want to have like a front perspective, a back perspective and a right perspective, or you don't have to stitch it together manually. Now, what's also cool about multi-image prompting is the images don't have to be generated, right? You can use real world images of a location and have that be stitched together. So this is actually the entrance to the World Labs office in San Francisco. And here's another example of uh, their conference room in San Francisco as well. So you can see these images on the left. That's what's getting stitched together into this experience on the right. So now imagine comparing this to the classical way of doing Gaussian splatting. You'll probably capture on the order of hundreds of images. Now that's being reduced down to just four in this case. So what's especially cool about this is now they also support 360 images as an input. So whether that's something you've generated with a LoRa, for example, or captured in the real world, like these images I captured in what, like 2018 with a 360 camera, I tried running a bunch of these through World Labs and got some great results. Let me give you a peek. So here's that same image. And now we can maneuver around with six degrees of freedom. And the results are pretty freaking cool. And so the real world aspect to me is very trippy because like I remember going to this place, right? And capturing this now being able to experience it with this added dimensionality is insane and perfectly suited for putting into a VR headset. And in the Marble Viewer itself, you can open any of these in your VR headset of choice using WebXR, which is also really, really cool. That saves you one extra step of having to export out these files and throw them into some kind of viewer. So this is a place called the Lothi Garden in New Delhi. And so you can check this out like this one. I can walk around this hallway. I can even look outside. And yeah, like the creativity of these generative models is it does a pretty good job of realizing, hey, the outsides are exposed. I get some pretty cool results. And you can very quickly imagine why this would be very, very interesting when you start putting them together with the next tool that I'm going to talk about. So look, each of these worlds in isolation is going to be pretty limited, right? So this is an example of what happens when you go outside the bounds of, you know, a small capture that you might do. So like one 360 degree panorama or one image like that you've used to create a world. When you go outside of the bounds, you get all these artifacts. But what you can do is create another world and stitch it together. And so to make all of that easier, Marble now has these editing tools for Gaussian splats baked right in. You don't even need to take it into something like Super Splat. You know, essentially you use a brush tool to stomp out the areas that you want to connect the other splat to, get the other scene in and basically weave it all together exactly like like this. So that gives you a lot of flexibility to essentially find the extremities of these worlds and almost like generative expand them and connect them all together. So with multiple generations put together, suddenly you can create these expansive environments that you can use for your games, your XR experiences, or even as the set for your generative media projects. Now let's talk about world editing, right? Because, you know, having a 3D environment is one piece of it. You know, you can even connect a bunch of these together. But what if you want to make more point fixes, almost like in painting inside of this 3D world? Well, they've got a pretty simple but clever workflow to make that stuff happen. So to do that, they've got this now new advanced editing mode that you can check whenever you're doing a generation with your 2D inputs, panoramas, videos, whatever. And essentially you get this intermediate step where you can now select a specific area of that image or pano and use instruction based editing models, probably like Nano Banana or Quen Image Edit under the hood to make tactical changes, right? So you're like, oh, I want to change that couch to be a blue color. Cool. Just select it, change it. Boom. You can do it all on the same UI without losing your flow state. 
state, and then you run it through the traditional generation process. And that's, of course, really powerful if you want to do simple things like removing objects in a scene or adding things, very, very easy to do. You know, perhaps you don't like the fireplace over there and you want to have a little bit of a stage for your XR experience, or well, just make that very simple instruction-based edit and you're off to the races. Now, this really blows my mind because it lets you do stuff that was like this complicated multi-step workflow just like two years ago. Like I made this in 2023 and it was like, you know, a 3D scan, then you're doing control net, then you're using absinthe and all this other stuff is now basically reduced down to instruction-based editing. So you want to change what a different type of top in your kitchen looks like, you do that. Change the flooring, do that with relative ease. Create some crazy decor that you would never want to try in real life. For some reason, you want to throw a goddamn basement going down into God knows where, you can do that too. Now, another really popular workflow is to sketch out stuff roughly in 3D, and then you use generative AI to take it all the way. You can do that all inside of marble as well. They call it chisel mode. And as Essentially here, you can like flesh out primitives exactly like this, right? Like blocky primitives of the rough layout that you want in the environment. And then boom, you essentially reskin it. And how this works under the hood is actually pretty clever. You've got this lightweight web-based editor. You can draw walls, you can like blow stuff out and it creates this like grayscale depth map that it's using then to, you know, essentially condition the panoramic generation, which it then runs, runs through its pipeline to create an actual 3D world that you can navigate. So a bunch of this stuff would have required you to jump into a bunch of different software like Blender, doing a depth map export, maybe taking it to Comfy or Weavy or whatever it is that you use, then exporting it out into World Labs and now you just do it all in one place, which is awesome. All right, now let's talk about what you can do with it, right? Like one of the most popular things to do with these type of 3D captures is to just render out video, right? Like I'm doing here and reskinning it into different styles suddenly that static capture is brought to life, right? You've got like dynamic reflections, light sources, you know, even like the haze and the fog in the environment. So Marble now has this really cool export mode called enhanced video. So you can use their camera editor to flesh out the camera moves that you want. And then it will take the underlying prompt that you used and all that other good stuff to condition the generation. So that it does a couple things. One is like, it's filling up all the artifacts. The fire is now moving. The water is now dynamic. And you've got this experience that's suddenly brimming with light. Life, what started as a static scene. So very quickly, you can take that static environment that you've got, reskin it to a completely different aesthetic, still have the same layout, and have all the cool exports that you're used to. Now, this is a great time for us to talk about the interactive stuff that you can do with these assets. If you notice down here, you've got a bunch of different options, right? You can export stuff out as splats, of course, in both SPZ and PLY formats, but you can also export out a collider mesh, essentially the geometry that a game engine would use to do hit testing or physics collisions and things like that, as well as a high quality mesh. Now, this is really powerful because you can take these exports and throw them into like a proper 3D software with a proper 3D rendering engine. Like, so conveniently, the 2026 alpha of Octane Render actually supports splats natively. So you bring all these assets in, right? Your GLTF, your splat PLY or SPZ. Now you automatically, without having to do anything of these perfectly aligned assets, right? Which itself was a pain in the ass to do before this. Now you can start framing your shots, getting immaculate freaking reflections, but not just reflections, intersections with geometry to shadow catching and shadow casting. All of that stuff will just work out of the box. This is like exceedingly powerful if you're doing 3D content creation in a proper 3D environment. and don't wanna have to resort to doing everything with generative edits. And of course, from that, you can still, you know, they've got a really good panoramic lens model. You can use that to export out full 360 videos in 3D for YouTube. I actually have a bunch of these kind of videos on the Billy FX channel on YouTube if you wanna check those out. Okay, now since these are actual 3D environments, you can also put them on a virtual production set, which is really cool because all the launch video scenes were actually generated this way, like made inside of World Labs, real characters, but everything projected onto this LED capture volume. So here they're using the HTC Vive tracker. So as you can see in these scenes, as the camera moves around, the view for stem of the camera is projected onto the wall over there. So that's exactly what the camera ends up seeing. Now this would have taken a bunch of time and effort to build these scenes inside of Unreal Engine. And like, do you really want to do that if this thing's going to just be in the background with a little bit of like bokeh blur on it? Like probably Probably not. You want to spend more time on getting the right content and subject matter than you do having like complete fine grained control inside of Unreal Engine. So this is really a happy medium. Now, since splats are so fast at rendering 
in both real time and web environments. You can imagine them being very cool for applications such as VR chat or HTC's own social VR applications. We have a bunch of avatars and you're exploring a space, you're maybe even building it together. Now, if you don't even want to capture things on a green screen or a virtual production set, you can do this all inside the computer too. And our very own Theoretically Media has a really cool case study featured here. We're basically saying that, look, once you have a 3D environment, you can actually explore it and make decisions about like camera angles that you just wouldn't think to prompt. And I think that's a really, really important point and benefit of 3D that just doesn't get stated enough. So in this case, you're basically using these environments as sort of like a scouting tool. You're, you're scoping out the shots that you want, like you're in for director of photography mode. And then you use your image editing model of choice, you know, with a character style sheet reference to add your characters in and then run this through the usual image to video workflow that you're probably used to. Very easy way to not only have consistent characters, but also consistent environments. Now, the potential for fully interactive experience is pretty amazing too, as Jose shows in this experience that he built inside of Unreal Engine 5. Like basically he's made an on-rail shooter, right? Like, so you're, you've got full-blown Unreal Engine with mixed 3D assets. You've got this gun and it's like those arcade shooters where you're just going on this, on this Rails experience and you go about shooting all these apparitions that show up all over the place. It really shows the potential of like, this may not be a AAA quality right now, but if you're trying to ideate and figure out what the game mechanics or the game set and setting is going to look like, this is a much faster and easier way to validate those type of questions as a team, maybe before doing it the good old fashioned way, but saving a lot of money in the pre-production process. Now, this video wouldn't be complete if we don't talk about spatial intelligence, which is really the lifelong vision and mission of Fei Fei Li, who's been doing all this stuff since the early ImageNet days, right? And she says something very beautiful here, which is like LLMs have begun to transform how we access and work with abstract knowledge, but these LLMs remain wordsmiths in the dark, eloquent, but inexperienced, knowledgeable, but ungrounded. So if you're building a robotic brain that's largely powered by a visual language model, I mean, you need to give it a lot of 3D environments to explore in. And so the last use case for this type of technology for your simulus synthetic training data, you can do it all inside of these world lab environments and pull it into something like NVIDIA Omniverse to do the rest. For instance, what they're doing here in Isaac Sim, which is really built, you know, on top of Omniverse. So suddenly you can start training these like, you know, quadruped dogs to figure out how to navigate 3D spaces. So look, you can create these digital twins of the environment, whether they're captures of the real world or whether they're synthetically generated and you can manually explore them in 3D as well, right? Which is itself super powerful. It's another thing entirely to have an intelligence that can understand these 3D worlds and take action in them. Not just very specific actions that you give it, but almost like you would talk to a human partner and ask them to do stuff either in the real world or inside of a video game. So that's exactly what SEMA 2 does, right? Like you can give these high level instructions like fly to a red flower. It'll figure out where the red flower is and fly to it. Okay. And then you ask it, what kind of flower is this? It'll be able to answer that question. And that's amazing because this is essentially the best of both worlds, right? Like you get the world knowledge of something like Gemini, but now you're infusing in it this ability to navigate and take action in these 3D worlds and do it in this multi-turn interactive fashion. So here's another example. You ask the model, like, where are you, right? Like, so this is in no man's sky. It's like, okay, I'm on this rocky surface and here's where I'm at. Okay, what are you doing here? Like, okay, I have detected this like distress signal and it's like, okay, can you look around and just kind of figure out what's going on? Okay, check out those egg-shaped objects. It'll go do that. Maybe you're in a very simple Roblox-like environment. You're like, you can even give higher order instructions like go to the house that's colored like a ripe tomato, right? It's like, all right, what's the ripe tomato one? Okay, cool, I found it, let me go to it. And it says like, based on the ripe tomato the red house down the street it's like i've gotten here and then the reasoning is really cool you can kind of inspect this chain of thought of like how it arrived at that conclusion you can also give instructions in emoji you're like okay sleepy time go find the bed <laughs> it's like oh well i can't sleep right now it's like okay go time to chop some wood my guy and off it goes <laughs> starting to chop wood and what's particularly cool is it's not trained on a bunch of these environments such as minecraft mine dojo and there's a huge difference in the success rate between sema one and two like we're talking about 13 percent increase in mine dojo over here and if you generally look look at the task completion rates, right? Like based on human evaluators, they found that humans are like roughly a little over 75% success rate when completing tasks that you give them. Between SEMA 1 and SEMA 2, there's a huge jump. We're going from 31 to 65%. That's pretty amazing. To make the side-by-side -side comparison really, really prominent, like let's look at SEMA 1 versus SEMA 2 in Mind Dojo. Like go up slightly left to the left cave and get some coal. SEMA 1's like, oh crap, what do I do? Whereas obviously SEMA 2 just found it and it's like mining the coal. Amazing. What's also cool is since this is a multi modal model, right? It's after all Gemini under the hood. You can also prompt it based on scribbles and be like, find this object 
drawn in the sketch and then jump on top of it, right? So that kind of looks like a spaceship. So it's like looking around for the space. It's like, ah, oh, there it is. And then it jumps right on top of it and does exactly what you asked. So now this looks all whimsical, right? But you can imagine this is like a step towards a robot instead of this goat doing the tasks that you give it, or like this model essentially figuring out like, what are the things I can do in the physical world and then doing it for you? And of course, it's not perfect right now. Like I just wanted to point out like over here, when you ask it to go uh, to that right bread house, like it totally walks into that pole. But it's also amazing because this model isn't doing like underlying tool use, like some tool use to say, hey, can I do path planning in the world and use that to chart like a path from point A to point B that let's say that it identified. It's just seeing the gameplay and then it has all the same controls that a human's used to. Now, a really cool capability in SEMA 2 is its ability to essentially self-improve. So it can do this like undirected play in these environments and start developing skills that it previously didn't have. And that's where this reward model comes in, right? Like, so maybe a human observer is like setting some tasks and you're having a conversation with this agent, all that loop can happen without the human too, where you're just observing it and it itself is getting better. And of course, uh, when we talk about world models, we have to talk about Genie 3, right? We've already got an amazing video about AI world models and Genie 3, which you should absolutely check out. Um, but those are basically like hallucinating interactive 3D worlds on the fly. And of course, you can put SEMA agent into the mix there too. So for example, if you prompt a Genie world where you're essentially a butterfly flying through a meadow, you could basically be like, hey, like, fly to a red flower. And now it's prompting Genie 3 and trying to fly to the red flower. And then you ask it what it is and it says Poppy. That's amazing because of course it has the world knowledge of Gemini under the hood. Now, I cannot stress enough how important world models are. In fact, I made that whole video about if you want to go deeper, Tesla is already using tech like this, right? Like that's based around like essentially generative feed forward Gaussian splatting. And, you know, basically if you've got original scene like this, you tell it, hey, make the vehicle cut across, you know, ego vehicles path, ego being like the vehicle that's like observing this experience from an egocentric perspective. You could do that. Like it's really freaking cool. So this idea of training AI inside of AI generated machines, real world captures is going to be increasingly important. So you capture a dynamic outdoor space like this, you got, you know, Canvas Play's LOD streaming system. So you can do these very, very large scale environments. You could see how this is like super useful for both utility and delight for framing all the shots that you want with the Tim workflow that we just looked at, but also all the robotics workflow that we're looking at with the stuff that NVIDIA is doing with Omniverse. Not to mention a bunch of other companies out there like Tesla itself. And we need this, right? Because like, otherwise these robots, whether they're operating in the physical world or the digital world are gonna go wild. Now in the near term, one thing I'm excited about is the convergence of this tech. This paper called Motion Stream that didn't get that much attention, um, essentially allows you to take advantage of like video diffusion models. Like instead of Genie 3, we're using WSAD to navigate the environment, right? Like you can instead interactively generate video based on the motion inputs, like drawn trajectories, camera movements, motion transfer, all this stuff, and do it at 30 frames per second. Suddenly it starts feeling more like performance capture, right? Like you're in real time painting motion paths and watching the AI generated video follow your performance. And I think that's gonna be very, very very cool, whether it's a human controlling these generations inside of a creation tool or a robotic brain that we're training to do stuff in the physical world. Anyway, so I can't wait to share more about what World Labs is doing, what Google is doing, and also what's coming for the author for this motion stream paper, like which brings a bunch of these concepts together. It is truly an honor to have a very small part to play as an angel investor in this company and have a small amount of equity in the amazing work that World Labs is doing as well. And of course, Google, I mean, like, holy crap, like this, the convergence of all of these techniques that we're talking about, I think are the shape of both the future of utility and delight, whether you see it or not. And if you really want to see what I'm talking about, go deep dive into that video on world models if you haven't already. Balavel signing off and I'll see y'all in the next one. Cheers.